Hello, I'm Fernando Guerra, Professor of Political Science and Chicano Studies at Loyola Marymount University. I'm also the director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. In addition, I am the host for the Urban Lecture Series, the program you are about to view. Here at Loyola Marymount University, we take pride in having our students engaged in the civic dialogue of Los Angeles. We send our students out to the community, but in addition, through this program, we bring the community to Loyola Marymount University. We hope you are informed by today's program. And for more information about Loyola Marymount University, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, and the Urban Lecture Series, please check out our website at lmu.edu backslash CSLA. Okay, okay, again, again this, this is, is a, a um, study that is being released tomorrow by the Center, Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We are entitling it the Leadership Initiative, Los Angeles Leaders in Education. This is part of a broader study. We're trying to understand how leaders in Los Angeles view a variety of different public policy areas. Uh, one, one of the, the major issues, issues that, that we have faced in Los Angeles and we've seen throughout this le uh, lecture series is the concept of fragmentation. fragmentation. We, we talked about, about geographic fragmentation, fragmentation ethnic fragmentation, 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 fragmentation in the economic sector. sector. And, and many, many observers, observers or commentators of Los Angeles have talked about how difficult it is to centralize Los Angeles or to get a consensus amongst Los Angeles. Uh, one, one of the, the ideas, ideas that we that have at the center is to try to establish what we consider the top 1,000 leaders, leaders in, in Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. There's, There's nothing, nothing magical about 1,000. It could be 900 or it could be 1,005. Uh, but so we've uh, targeted, targeted to get at least 1,000. And of these 1,000, we're trying to get about 100 in these individual areas that you see listed here. Today, we're going to be talking about the 100 within uh, education. Uh, the, the idea, idea is, is that, that as issues come up, uh, that, that we, we would, would do periodic, periodic surveys amongst these 1,000 or the individual 100 to try to see if there's a consensus amongst leaders in terms of what the uh, definition of the challenge is and more importantly, what the uh, solutions would be. So I can imagine that there is really right now no process of bringing all these leaders together. And certainly with the panelists that you've had throughout this whole series, if you were to ask those individuals to come to, uh, to LMU or to USC or to any other uh, educational institution or other civic organization, I'm pretty sure that we can get a, a lot of them there. However, the d degree of difficulty is not the one-time meeting, but sustaining that over time. And so what we are trying to do here is develop a process where we can have a sustained dialogue, a sustained civic discussion amongst leaders, and doing this through surveys and through uh, different uh, techniques that we're developing. And so we're just beginning to do this. We've interviewed 100 political leaders, and that list comes from the, uh, if you recall when we made the presentation on 50 years of political diversity, and we had the top 100 leaders, those were the leaders that we interviewed uh, about two years ago. Now we're doing this with education, and in uh, um, two weeks we'll do a similar presentation regarding health that we have done. So, So we surveyed educational leaders who impact policy, who practice, who are advocates, or who do research. And only those leaders who responded as of the reporting date are included in this report, which is of, as of March uh, 30, uh, excuse me, March 21st. So the results that you have are from 74 individuals. And we're continuing to do the survey, and we'll have final results during the, during the summer. So let me give you some demographics of some of the leaders that have, um, that have answered. Uh, gender, 39% male, 61% female. So it's slightly uh, um, biased towards female, but not really in terms of representative of the gender that you see in education. Uh, heavily female-oriented, uh, um, the uh, field of education. Uh, in terms of education, 88% of our respondents reported of having a graduate or professional degree. Uh, we expected that, so that's not unusual. Uh, in, terms in terms of racial or ethnic, ethnic origin, 47% are white, 31% Latino, 13% African American, 6% Asian. Residency, over 95% live in Los Angeles County, and 70 have lived in, the, uh, in Los Angeles for 16 years or more, so they are invested. 
ideological beliefs. We just asked the question, where do you see yourself on, on this line? And you can see that 41% are liberal and 22% moderately liberal. Not at all surprising given that this is the city of Los Angeles and that they are educational leaders. We were not surprised by this, but it is um, a, a quote unquote, the liberal bias you don't only see here at Loyola Marymount University, but throughout the education field. You can't help but become more liberal the more you get educated. Ninety-one percent of respondents stated that the K through 12 public education system was in need of major change. Not a, a surprise to us. I think there's consensus amongst that. So this is the number one finding, something that everybody somewhat agrees, but we see the same surveys when we ask uh, just teachers themselves, when we ask residents, when we ask voters, no matter what the universe is, it, we have a pretty much across the board that something is wrong with education and it needs to be fixed. So that's an easy uh, consensus. Uh, when rating the quality of education at the local and state level, an overwhelming majority of respondents said LAUSD was a poor quality, 69%, compared to 36% of the respondents who said California's public schools were a poor quality. Now there may be a little bit bias there in that most of these individuals that are respondents are very familiar with LAUSD and they see its failings and the grass is always greener on the other side, meaning other school districts within the state. But we're gonna ask uh, obviously some of our panelists what they think about that particular finding. While 80% of our leaders approved of the way President Obama is handling education policy, 86% disapproved the way Governor Schwarzenegger is handling it. Um, it it's, uh, makes sense, not only the liberal leanings, the partisan leanings, but uh, President Obama has just gotten there and federal policy doesn't have as much impact on the day-to-day -day as uh, state policy, and especially with uh, uh, Schwarzenegger having to deal with budget cuts and a variety of those more contentious issues. We're not surprised by this at all. Alternative schooling, two-thirds of our respondents oppose the use of school vouchers to pay for a portion of the cost to send children to private schools, and we'll have a little discussion about that with our, our panelists. Alternative schooling, two-thirds of our respondents believe that pilot schools are an effective approach to education reform in Los Angeles. And again, we'll have a little discussion about what is a pilot school and how they have been working. An overwhelming majority of respondents agree that high school students should pass a minimum competency or proficiency test in order to receive a high school diploma. And in conclusion, there, uh, our results will be available in the summer of 2010. And if you want a copy, certainly come to our, our website and we'll keep updating. And if you have any questions, feel free to talk to myself or any of the researchers at the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. One final comment, while I'm making this presentation and putting my name on it and taking all the credit, especially for the good stuff, all the work was really done by um, two, two individuals who work at, at, the, uh, at the center, and that's uh, Melissa, Melissa Warnstein and Brian Gilbert. I want the two of them. Welcome to Loyola Marymount University and the Urban Lecture Series, sponsored by the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles, also co-sponsored by the Political Science Department, Chicano Studies, Economics Department, African American Studies, uh, Urban Studies programs here at Loyola Marymount University. Today we're going to be talking about education and the state of education in the city of Los Angeles and surrounding communities. We have several guests who have been intimately involved for a very long time in the field of education. Uh, survey after survey that we take here at the center and that we've uh, seen from all kinds of different jurisdictions using different universes, meaning whether we're talking to voters or to residents, to students or to teachers, and we ask them, what's the most important subject matter facing America today or facing the state of California or facing your community? It's always education that's number one. Uh, even, even in this recession and this crisis, where the economy and jobs has certainly spiked in terms of the interest of uh, individuals, education still is considered more important than, than the economy. So we typically have education, the economy, crime, and increasingly in Los Angeles, such things as transportation. But education is number one in everyone's uh, um, surveys that we do. So much so that um, we've now started asking some of the questions. Uh, uh, beyond education, what are your most important issues? Because 
having education in there skews everything else because you know they're always going to uh, choose education overwhelmingly. Um, there is a consensus that there's much to do uh, in education. There's a consensus that the system is broken and that there's a consensus that we must reform. But part of the issue is that we constantly try to reform and we don't give reform enough time and we come up with more reforms before the reforms of four or five years ago were ever implemented. Um, let me introduce uh, two of our um, panelists and uh, start with some very basic questions about some of the, the findings. Um, we have with us, uh, right next to me, Angela Bass, who is Superintendent of Instruction in Partnership for Los Angeles Schools. She's not the Superintendent for LA Unified, but she'll explain a little bit about what, what that is. She was appointed superintendent for, of instruction for the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools in February of 2008. I can go on and on about what that is, but I'm gonna let her kind of explain that. Previously, Ms. Bass was executive director of the Baldrige Center in San Diego Unified School District, the second largest school district in California. Prior to this role, she served as the San Diego district as instructional leader and was responsible for a learning community of 20 schools 45 administrators, 600 teachers, and approximately 15,000 students. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of San Diego, um, one of the universities in our league, which I think we beat twice this year in basketball, so it's okay to have you here. Um, previous years we weren't so lucky. She has a bachelor's degree in liberal arts from San Francisco State University, a master's degree in educational leadership from U.S. International University, and she's currently pursuing a doctorate in educational leadership at the University of San Diego. This is, yeah. Oh, finishing here. All right. She realized where you really need to get an education. Yeah. Um, Next to her is Steve Barr, founder and chair emeritus of Green Dot. He founded Green Dot Schools in 1999. The Los Again, I'm gonna let him describe to you a little bit about what Green Dot is. Uh, in 19, uh, excuse me, in, the, in 2006, the Los Angeles Times named Mr. Barr as one of the 100 most influential people in Southern California, not just about education, not just about charter schools, but overall in terms of a, a, his civic role that he plays. In addition to leading Green Dot, Mr. Barr is State Board of Education appointee to the Advisory Commission on Charter Schools. Uh, in 1990, uh, Steve was co-founder of Rock the Vote. Now, Steve, most, Most of our students here were actually born in 88, 89, 90. So you're going to have to explain to them what Rock the Vote was. We have had Rock the Vote since then, but not, not to the extent that it happened in 90 and 94. Following Rock the Vote, he led successful efforts to pass the Mortar Voter Bill in 1994, where 30, Ameri 30 million Americans have registered to vote using the, uh, via the Mortar Voter. And we'll have Mr. Barr talk a little bit about that. And I can go on and on all about uh, uh, Mr. Barr's accomplishments and, and all the accolades that, I can, uh, that have been bestowed on him, which are very deserving. Uh, he's a good friend of uh, Loyola Marymount University. Uh, next, next to him, him we have uh, Ms. Yoli Flores Aguilar. She, she is the vice president of the Los, Los Angeles Unified, Unified School Board. board. Um, she, that, that is, is the board, board that governs the second, second largest uh, school, school district in, in, in the nation. nation. She's na nationally renowned and a tireless advocate for children. She has dedicated her life to helping ensure that all kids grow up with opportunities to lead a rich and fulfilling life. Serving the children and families of District 5, Ms. Flores represents a diverse community of 115,000 students at 116 schools. That would probably be the second largest school district in the state if it was its, its own, own district. Uh, she is a first generation Mexican American. I have known Yoli for over 20 years. I can't even remember the first time we've met. I've known her as a, an activist in the East Side, a political activist, and someone who has got her heart in the right place. Again, I can go on and on and talk about all all of her great uh, accomplishments. I always like to go to talk about where they went to school, uh, not to make fun of them per se, but just to tell you how educated they are. Uh, she is a, got a BA from the University of Redlands and her master's in social welfare from UCLA. Thank you all three for coming, appreciate that. Um, uh, 
I'm going to start off with two very general questions for uh, both um, Angela and Steve. Um, number one, what is the organ what are you doing right now? What's the organization? And for Steve, really a, a green dot because I know you're you're no longer running the day to day, but still heavily involved. And about these findings that we just presented. Uh, anything, anything surprising there and any general, general comments. So first, what are you doing, doing right now? What's your position? position? What, what, what is it that you uh, have uh, uh, an, impact an impact over? Thank you, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I think it's always a great opportunity to talk about. It's always a great opportunity to talk about how do we serve our children better. There we go. There we go. There we go. How do we serve our children um, in quality ways so that every child gets a quality education? One of the unique things I think about Los Angeles is that there has been for the last 30 years a very uh, concerted effort to try to reform, improve the quality of education. And given its size, I think there would be great discussion tonight about where it's worked and where it still has challenges. The work that I'm involved in with the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools began about Truly about five years when um, Mayor Antonio Villagosa really sought to change the schools in Los Angeles and wanted to oversee them because what he saw as the mayor of Los Angeles were schools that were failing. And he felt as um, many uh, large urban districts across this nation, um, they have mayoral control and where that is happening, there is a greater thrust of change in those schools. Uh, because, because of the constitutional, the constitutional laws, laws in California, California he, was he was not able to attain that. that. And there are many reasons that we could talk about why, but, but it was, was not able to attain a uh, mayoral, mayoral control, control over the schools. And, and in his, his quest, quest to continue to show that, that we can educate, educate all of our children, that our children are brilliant, brilliant. he joined in partnership with Los Angeles Unified School District because he said, we have to improve the public schools and we have to improve them jointly. So Partnership for LA Schools is a nonprofit entity that joined in partnership serving 19,000 students in Los Angeles. We really wanted to make sure that we could demonstrate this quickly and accelerate performance, and so we have the lowest performing schools in um, LA Unified, but also in the state of California, we have the lowest 5%. So we needed to demonstrate very quickly that number one, we can transform schools in public education, we can transform it. Um, very rapidly and we can do it with our lowest performing school and not be stigmatized by poverty, demographics, et cetera. So our, our agenda is working very closely with LA Unified. All of our teachers are in the UTLA bargaining unit. All of our students um, are the students that live in the community school who arrive every day. And our goal is to really take the teachers who've been there who for the last, in my school's 20 years, we have now 15 schools that really have been underserved. Not, Not necessarily, necessarily monetarily, monetarily at first, but they've been underserved with resources, technology. Teacher turnover um, has been a churn at many of my schools for 38 years. I'm sorry, 38% of the teachers every year have been coming in and out of these schools. So our goal has been to go into these schools, understand what has been the challenges, examine the culture, turn that culture around, place best leadership in the schools, um, improved, improved practice, practice at a rapid rate, rate with our teacher, teacher practice, practice and really began to accelerate performance. And in 18 months, I think, I think we have done a noble, noble job. We are not there because these schools are at the bottom. bottom. But in, in the last 18 months, months we, we have begun, begun the transformation of schools in a public, public setting, setting in partnership with LA Unified, Unified School District. And we can talk more about that. So let me get this right. You took a group of schools from LA Unified and you still have the same school buildings same school buildings. The same, same students, same students, same, same teachers. teachers. What, what is different? I think, I think what, what, what we, have we have discovered is that these schools have been have been given the one size fits all service, and the status of the school achievement and the needs of these schools needs to be different. It cannot be the same support, the same service. We also needed to be able to try different innovations and break away from the. The, the, the things that the bureaucracy of a school system keep you down. Yeah. Usually poor performing schools get blamed, get faulted, and actually go under higher regimentation of do this, do this this day, and the next day, without really bringing these teachers together and allowing them the opportunity to kind of look at the teachers, the parents, and the community. What do, what do these schools need that 
instead of just saying, saying here you are and walk away. Teachers, teachers can't teach at these schools because there haven't been the support. So I've got schools, two high school, three high schools, um, four middle schools, and uh, four elementary schools where every year there's been a new principal. So you have a school that was nine years and had 11 principals. You cannot improve schools without great leadership. You cannot improve schools without sustainability. So we're trying to create those sustainable practices on that campus. About two years ago, during this lecture series, we had former Mayor James Hahn on the panel. And he talked about the 2005 election that he lost to uh, then Councilman, now Mayor Antonio Villaragosa. During the primary, he mentioned that uh, uh, Bob Hertzberg, who was a former assembly member, former speaker, was also a candidate, that he pounded on the then mayor about education. And the mayor said that as he would go around, they would ask him, well, how do you respond to Hertzberg? And Mayor Hahn had previously been the city attorney. So very lawyerly-like, he would explain that he had no control over schools, none, none whatsoever. And he said that throughout the campaign, he started realizing that people would look at him and say, you're just being a typical politician not trying to take responsibility. And, and he could just see the people, that he was losing people as he would respond appropriately, that he had no control over schools. And so one of the constant themes that we've had almost every single one of our panels has talked about the weak mayor formally that the mayor has very little power. Last time we met, we talked about transportation and what little power that the mayor had in that area. And so here's another area. The mayor has absolutely no formal power, but uh, Mayor Antonio Villaragosa tried to change that. He got a law passed in the state and then it was overturned. And so then he came to this agreement. How did this agreement come about? How did he do it? If it wasn't by law, he negotiated with LA Unified? Yes, yes, I, I think, think that, that we, we did. did. We, come, we have a five-year five memorandum of understanding, but I think what was, what's, what's different about our mayor is that he truly is committed. He didn't quit. He didn't let the law, the state constitution say, I can't help improve schools, because he has a city that needs to have educated future of, of, of future workers. And so he really stayed the course. He met with the then superintendent, um, David Brewer, along with the board members, and really tried to structure a conversation around let us support and improve schools. I know we can do that. Um, we had to have a 50% plus one vote from our teachers union. And um, literally it was somewhat of a campaign where uh, CEO Marshall Tuck went out and uh, along with other staff and really met with schools. And many of the lowest performing schools were tired. They were tired of being um, mandated things that were not really improving education. And, and there was, was no, no true sustainability in these teachers' eyes, eyes that it could get better, and they, and they were, were looking, looking for an option. option. And, and one, one of the thing, one of the agreements with the MOU is that, is that we can do things differently. differently. There's, There's a standard, standard curriculum in our in the district in LUSD that is um, open core. Well, we can use that, but we can look at other options because our children have many, many more needs, and so we look at that. So we're able to bring in community resources, city resources. We get to look at instead, instead of, of saying why, why, we could say why not and ask. The, the other part, part of our work is to incubate best practices. practices. So, so we brought in a, a stellar group of, of instructional leaders to be again to work with schools. You've got to have great teaching and learning if you're going to accelerate uh, performance. And so we brought in people who were practitioners who were skilled in that and really gave intensive executive coaching to principals, intensive support for teachers, but really empowered these teachers to say, what do you need, why do you need it, and then really work with teachers versus telling teachers what to do on a day-to-day -day basis and really help grow teacher leadership at, in its finest level. I will be honest that it is, it's a struggle because it's new. We're trying to find our groove with, with the LA Unified because LA Unified still has rules and compliances. We're free from some, but not all. But we truly have a fundamental belief that we can take schools to scale within LA Unified and have high-performing schools and what have been historically underperforming communities and demonstrate that. And we have some evidence to, that shows that we're on the pathway. Steve, this is, Angela's group is not a charter school. Um, what, uh, what is a charter school? Well, a charter school is a public school that uh, 
you know, in my view, creates uh, research and development of what school districts could become. Um, there's a lot of other people have different opinions of what charter schools are, but um, I started Green Dot Public Schools over 10 years ago now, 10 years ago. And Actually, were, you, were you a school teacher? No. I never were you a principal? I never had any uh, educational experience except for being a bored uh, suburban high school student, C average student, uh, which now I wear as a badge of honor. Um, but back then I just thought, I was seriously um, uh, curious and thoughtful. I read a lot, but um, I would sit in classrooms, and as you remember, and some of you in this room obviously remember since you're not that far away from it, you know, when you're an adolescent, your, your BS meter is so finely tuned. And I used, I used to sit in that, that, I used to sit in that classroom and think, that, that might be University of San Diego or something like that. This is Loyola Marymount. That's, that's right. I understand. That's why I said BS. Um, um, but so what I'd say to you is that, you know, I used to sit in that class as a student and sit there and really think about what, at what point did that person in front of me forget what it's like to be 15? They're mailing it in. They are not even, they don't respect me enough to tell me why I'm learning this. I'm sitting next to 15-year-old girls. That's no picnic for a 15-year-old boy. And... I'm, I'm just, just being, being bored to death. And so um, I, I don't have, have the tools to sit and just memorize this work till Friday and then and take, take a test on Monday and then soon after that forget it. I want to learn. And, and so, so I, I think, think that, that the educational, educational I looked at the educational sector. sector. Now, now, having said that, I actually, I jumped to class. class. I was the class in 1977 here in California. I went to public schools in Cupertino. My mom was a waitress. She moved to seven blocks to those schools. So I could go to the high school with the sons and daughters of Hewlett Packard engineers. And, and more California schools that I went to, and at that time and place, we used to laugh at kids who went to private school. That meant if you went to Bellarmine or Miller or, uh, or, or Mitty, I'm sorry, or St. Francis in the Bay Area where I'm from, that means you're, either you're a great sports athlete or your daddy had to buy you some structure because you couldn't cut it in public schools. And in fact, my rival public school, which is the one I should have went to but didn't have as good a basketball team, Two guys named Steve that were a couple years old and I went into a garage and created some company you may have heard of. I mean, this was the public school student of the time I went there. Now, the year after I graduated, we had a tax report in our public schools, and my adult lifetime have gone from the best to worst. And um, You're referring to Proposition 13 in 1978. That's right. And, um, but even those schools that were well-funded were still built for a different economy and a different population. It was built for a manufacturing society. And they used to tell you at that great high school I went to that 20% of you can do really well and go on to college, and 20% of you can't do anything for. But the vast majority, as long as you can read or write, there are jobs for you in this economy which will, which will give you enough income to buy a home and send your kids to college and have a pretty good life. The problem is now 50 years later, 30 years later after that tax revolt, um, what, has what has happened is we still run our schools the same way with less money and white people and in this city African American people have fled the system and um, so who's left in the system of an over 80% population of new Americans first generation second generation at best who aren't politically active are left with a system and leadership which really just rewards the grown-ups and, and cares less about the clients they're trying to serve so every decision that's made is based, based on, geez, do we upset, upset the adults, not, not who do we, we serve. serve. And, and so, so until, until we, we get a hold of that, that. so when, when I started Green Dot Public Schools, schools which, which actually wasn't founded in the basement of St. Roberts, but it was birthed there uh, when I met people from Lenox, uh, community not far from here. The reference to St. Roberts is our auditorium where the School of Education used to be headquartered there. Now they're headquartered two floors above us. Which, which is, is phenomenal, phenomenal because, because at that, that time, well, you know, you know when you're, when you're, when you're you know, just, just like, like a student going to a rundown school and you see what people think of you and this institution and how it's and, and under the guidance of Shane Martin and uh, great, great professors at this ed school of education. education. It was in the basement of St. Roberts. It was, I don't think it was any air conditioning. I think it was the first time I met you. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, now it's, it's one of the most beautiful um, and, and progressive schools of ed in the country. But the idea was pretty simple. I looked, I looked at, at um, and, 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 and for those who don't know, Green Dot, Green Dot now runs uh, 18 um, college prep campuses in Southern California, here in Los Angeles, in the highest need areas, the poorest areas, the highest dropout rates are, uh, are at, and one school in the South Bronx in New York, and we're pretty simple. We go in areas where there's 70% dropout rates, and we retain and graduate 80 to 90% of those same kids 
and three fourths of them go to four year universities. And some of them are at this university, in fact. And um, when you have those kind of results, and we're still only scratching the surface, you know, people have to listen. And so um, we also have our own collective bargaining agreement because, like I said, I was trying to create something that, not to create oases in the desert, but to create systemic change. And the way systemic change happens is, oh my God, that works and I can vision it in my neighborhood. And then we put pressure on our leaders to replicate that. It's, it's slow now, it hasn't happened as fast as, as possible. And you, you mentioned the mayor's race before uh, Brother Hertzberg um, brought that issue up. A group of us um, started the Small Schools Alliance and it was based on a very simple theory after spending Having some pretty good results in spending an extraordinary year and a half with uh, Governor Romer, who was our superintendent at that time. Um, and after spending all that time with him and not being able to come within the system to create change in secondary education, it really came down to if somebody that great and that smart couldn't figure this out and lead us, that really you have to look at the system. And I'm not saying it in one of those BS ways again, uh, because you're always sitting next to me, but she's the, the one great school board member on our school board but there's other good people on the school board. It's just a horrible system. It's seven people elected by 6% of the voters who oversee a budget that's bigger than the city of Los Angeles. So you're talking about a system that is very hard to move a failed system and correct it with a bunch of people that nobody knows who they are. And that's just very difficult. So what we saw is the few places where there was uh, and there has been results have been where there's mayoral control. And yes, there have been other cities where the their constitution, constitution had a weak mayor, mayor but you know, Adrian Fenty, young, young mayor of Washington, Washington D.C., ran for mayor and, and also changed, changed the constitution of that city at the same time and seized control of the schools and is now, you're seeing, you're seeing the benefits in Washington, D.C. What our mayor did, who I have a lot of respect for, and it's a tough city to build consensus on, he, he took the path of least resistance, which was a watered down version of that same act. But there's another mayor's race coming up and what's, why this is important for mayors to be involved with schools, if, you, if you're going to run for the, be the head of a city, you have to start with the premise, what makes a great city? Now, when people talk about Los Angeles, and it's a beautiful city with the Ellis Island of America, it's the, it's the most beautiful city because of the renewal that constantly happens from day to day here in the history here. The problem is we have an educational infrastructure that instead of nurturing that renewal, which should make this the most exciting city, it blunts it. But, and but why? 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 I mean, it, why? there's enough money, isn't there? Yes or no? Well, I, I think there could be more money, but money's not the answer. There's a lot of cities that have a lot more money than we do that are even worse at it than we are. But the point of it is the structure. You have... Um, but when you say the structure, be very specific for the students. The structure meaning what? The um, tenure of the teachers, the unions, um, the, the, the financial, financial system, system in terms of how schools get money, get money um, the, uh, the, the curriculum that's dictated, dictated from not only the state and the feds, but everybody tells you what you're, you're supposed to do in the classroom. Um, yeah. yeah, all, all of those, those things, things, and I'll put it in a very simple form. Let me put it this way. If Arnold Schwarzenegger found out tomorrow that his kids who go to Crossroads, which is one of the best uh, educational institutions in the world, high school in Santa Monica, if he found out tomorrow that 50% of the money that he pays of that 35 grand, whatever it costs to go to that school, doesn't make it to the school site, it goes to some office building downtown, consultants or whatever, you would pull the money quickly. You'd want every dollar in the class. LA Unified spends 50% on overhead? Yeah. Well, no, so here, here's, here's what, and you'll, we'll debate, we can get into the debating this. So we, yeah, well, there's mandated costs and there's this and that. I can tell you when we took over Locke High School and we did our analysis and budget analysis that, you know, that, that school produced because it has failed and it's mostly Title I money gets thrown at it. But it, what is Title I? Title I is uh, federal money that goes and follows students who are under the poverty line. So it's the Title I of a bill passed by Congress that dictated extra money for poor schools. That's right. And the money comes from the feds. That's right. So about $11,000 we <coughs> was generated per student at that school, high end. The problem with the system is the money doesn't go directly to that school site to be spent and, dec and decisions made at the school site. It goes into a general fund. And when you go to Locke High School before we took it over, you would see very young teachers, a lot of Teach for America teachers. You would see a lot of substitute teachers. And then you would see a handful of teachers who were there because they couldn't get jobs anywhere else. 
and I'm being very blunt and honest about this. Now, if you drove out to Taft High School or the suburbs, you would see schools that have a lot of teaching staff. So after we took over Loft High School, this happened in 2007, when the teachers rose up and were so fed up with the lack of support, not only by the district, but their union, and partnered with us to seize the school from the district, a few other schools around the city said, but geez, we want to do that too. So I drove up to, out to Taft High School out in the valley. And uh, you can always tell where you're at in the city like, by, the, by how nice the Ralphs is, or how not nice the Ralphs is. The Ralphs across the street from Taft, I got there a little early, so I went in to get a, a soda or something. It looked like a Whole Foods. The Ralphs I live in, I live in Silver Lake is like, you know, my wife calls it Ghetto Ralphs. It's Ghetto Ralphs. It doesn't have any, everything, there is no, Organic anything in that place. So, for so stuff it's growing out of the cracks crack somewhere. Yeah. So it's so, not. But I went into the faculty room. When, when you walk, walk into the faculty room, room at that school, school, all of the teachers looked like me. And the people on the floor, we were, they were all professional, experienced teachers. And you look at that. Wait a minute, you're, you're not a teacher or experienced. What do you mean they look like? I have gray hair, though. I mean, you can walk in. Okay, okay that's. So you, so you walk in and you see the and you see these teachers. You go like, well, how how are all these experienced teachers? How do they? How are they at one, one school? school? They, they can't, can't live within the budget. Well, they're being subsidized for the four schools into a general fund. Again, that's, that's what I'm talking, talking about. about the, the, the money that, that doesn't get to a school site, site that's generated by the attendance of that school. school. And it's and a bizarre, bizarre system. system. And, and there's, there's a lot, lot of people, people at fault. fault. But what, but what I, would I would tell you is, is when you're talking about a city like Los Angeles and how dynamic the city is with its population, the mayor, if you're talking about what makes a great city and you want to lead a city, you, you have, have to do, do whatever, whatever it takes to fix that problem. problem. And, and if it means changing the constitution of the city so you seize control, in a, in a crisis, crisis, which everybody talks about, it's a crisis. crisis. Well, there's, there's only one, one way to treat a crisis. crisis. The leader's got to step up. up. You know, yeah, when 9-11 happened, happened, I didn't I see everybody running to go find out who the school board members or the council members were. They were looking for the mayor. You need a singular voice to lead that is accountable to all the people. Everybody in the city, I guarantee you, knows who their mayor is. Unfortunately, not everybody knows who their school board member is. So you have yeah, to have that, that accountability, accountability and that kind of leadership, especially in a crisis. And in this city, we are in a crisis. How did, I mean, I remember the first time uh, I met you, and it's like, so this guy wants to talk about education. What's, where's the credentials? Where's the credibility? How, how did you come, how did you uh, uh, get beyond people saying, well, wait a minute, you don't have, you don't have a teaching credential. I mean, forget having a PhD like I do. Uh, or, uh, or, or or a master's. This guy doesn't even have a teaching credential. Well, why, why, why is he even talking about this? Why do we even invite him to this lecture series? Uh, so how do you, how do you answer that? Well, I tell you, you know, I'm going to be so kind to you because we're at Loyola Marymount and, uh, and you have a lot of fancy letters next to your name. But uh, um, how I did it was I found very smart people who believe in the vision. I put them on my board. And, and I, I went door to door in Lenox, and, and I met all of the parents. And they, they knew, knew and, the, and, and also, also that beautiful school system over there, and it's poor, uh, everybody, everybody knows, knows where Lenox is, right? Right next to Inglewood. They have a K-8 system, system of probably the, the poorest, poorest two unincorporated square miles in the Southern California region. And 70% of their babies, of their babies when, when they leave the middle school in Lenox would go to Hawthorne High School and not make it out of Hawthorne High School. So there was a desperation there. The irony of it is Hawthorne High School. Where, 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 where you know what Hawthorne High School is famous for? The beach. Awesome. I love the beach. The American, the California dream was manufactured at Hawthorne High School. Let me tell you something. There's no blonde-haired beach boy guys there anymore. I can tell you that right now. But 70% of those Lennox kids were not making it. So they were pretty desperate, and I kind of came along, and I think they said the Lennox School District, well, you know, you, we'll give you another benchmark to meet, and I kept meeting it. And then finally, and in fact, when I met uh, Professor Garrett, he's, I said, I'm going to open a school this fall. And I think you said, you're out of your mind. What are you, nuts? I think I was wearing a Dodger cap. I think I came in, I think I had a skateboard like yours. And I walked in. And, uh, but I wore those folks down and got the community involved. And we shared, as a good community organizer, I shared my life experiences, shared my story, and built the trust of the folks who were desperate for school. And we opened, we opened the school, school in August of 2000. 2000. It, was it was the first high school open in this region, this, in this metropolitan Los Angeles area, area in over 30 years. years. And the only, the only thing that happened in those 30 years is the population tripled, um, and high schools that were built for 1,500 kids, which is them, all the high schools in Los Angeles, 
when you, you don't, don't build, build a school, school and, and the population, population jumps, you gotta put them on top of each other. So the schools start looking more and more like prisons. So in a city that hadn't built a high school in 30 years, and a guy, yes, who did not have a PhD or a credential, um, and five teachers right out of college, uh, with, with no, no roadmap, roadmap. And, not and not just not, not a roadmap, roadmap in Los Angeles, but nationally. Like, like the, the secondary education, education is, is, is confounding most people in this country. But we, we started, started the school with a very simple premise. premise. We, we were going to run this public school like, like a Tony, Tony private school. school. We were going to make it small. We were going to lift the bar really high. We were going to spend the money in the classroom to support our teachers. And we were going to challenge the parents to be participants you know, and, and treat, treat them, them like, like they were getting, getting a private school education. We started with 140 kids, put them in uniforms. We did a laptop of student um, right by the uh, LAX in an old law school. And um, we started working the hell out of those kids. And guess what happened? Some miraculous things. We tripled the test scores in the first year in reading and math of Hawthorne High School. And it got a lot of people's attention because it's not easy covering public education in Southern California without CDC in a oh, but you took, mega not, not in Hawthorne High School, you, you tripled the scores for if had, they had gone to Hawthorne. You, they, they were not at Hawthorne High. Yeah, yeah but, but so we tripled, tripled the scores of the, of the scores from Hawthorne, from Lenox. And Lenox being the supposedly poorest and weakest theater area into Hawthorne High School, which is fed by a lot of Southern cities, Southern Bay cities. So the fact that these poor kids were you know, proficient, proficient three times, times the, the level of Hawthorne, Hawthorne High School got a lot of people's attention, and, uh, and then that's where it all started. Yoli Flores Aguilar, you are an elected school board member, LA Unified. If your the number of people that live in your district is more than four or five states, more people live in your district than live in the state of Alaska that elected uh, Palin. Um, I wasn't a common opinion, it was more about the geography. I want you guys, I want you guys to understand how large and how many people are in these districts, are in this, there are more school children in LA Unified than there are people in San Francisco. I mean, that's how big and how large we're, we're talking about this. Um, reformer, you've had a recent law that we talked about in terms of charter that I want to ask you about, but you, you, have you have to internalize to a lot of the criticisms about LA Unified, even though you've only been there, you know, a couple of years. Uh, how do you respond when you see a study like we're publishing here and people are saying, LA Unified is just, it's, it's, I don't want my kids going there, um, it, it's bad, it's, it needs to be reformed. Uh, how do you feel about that? Actually, I don't internalize it. I'm one of those critics. Oh, you're healthy. Um, and, uh, and I'm one of those individuals on the board. It doesn't feel good to do this, but that I am always, always asking for better and demanding better. Because what I have seen in my three years on the school board is absolutely unacceptable. In fact, this is what I have on my office door. It says, there's some data on here, and it says across, unacceptable. I'm going to read you this data. These are the high schools in my board district. I represent half of East LA, the, the part of East LA that feeds up into Garfield High School. I represent the Northeast part of the city, and those are communities like Highland Park, where I live, Eagle Rock, Mount Washington, Glassell Park, Cypress Park, a little bit of Silver Lake. And then, and then I, represent I represent the Southeast, southeast cities, and that's a cluster of cities in the Southeast part of the county, uh, cities uh, like Huntington Park where I grew up and went to middle and high school, Southgate, Bell, Cudahy, um, Maywood, and Vernon. So that's how we add up to the 115,000 kids. This uh, report and what sits on my door every day um, and it's what keeps my, um, some people would think it's very unhealthy, but it's what keeps my anger in check, okay? Um, report from the other school, UCLA. Uh, it's a report called Pathways to College, looking at the class of 2007. And it looks at the number of graduates, 
the graduates that um, have the A through G eligible requirements, those are the courses that you need in order to get to a UC school, number enrolled in community college, number enrolled in a CSU, and enrolled in a UC. I'm just going to give you two of those high schools example, okay? John uh, Marshall Senior High. It's actually one of the better high schools in my area. Out of every 100 ninth graders who began in 2003, out of 100, 49 graduate. 25 um, have the A through G requirements. 24 enroll in a community college. Six at a CSU. And five at a UC. Out of every 100 kids. In Southgate, out of every 100 ninth graders who started in 03 and went on four years, 28 graduated. 15 A through G eligible, 11 enrolled in community college, 6 at a CSU, 2 at a UC. But these are not cumulative numbers. In other words, that 6% is from that 49%. So don't add them up and say, oh, they're, it, no. She's talking of the 49% that did graduate. You know, th those only 15 Of the 28 were, that graduated in Southgate, only two went on to a UC, for example. Exactly. So out of the 100 that started, only two were UCL. So I can't be a happy camper. 30% of our third graders can read at third grade level. 30%. Um, and I'm not a teacher either, not an administrator. I'm a social worker. And I don't need to be a teacher to know that something is terribly, terribly wrong. What I need to be is an advocate for children and the person who, for good or for bad, will say, this is not acceptable. And I know that this district can do much better because we do have places in this district where with populations, same as these guys, these little kids, in other nearby schools are off the charts, soaring, but in most they're not. And so my challenge to the school district has been to replicate best practices, to get out of a culture of mediocrity and status quo, and if they don't want to or can't, then somebody else should be running our schools, because this is the future of our children. And that's, and that's the, the challenge, challenge that I've come to, and you guys know that. It does get me into a lot of trouble. I have a lot of people who don't like Yoli. Um, but I'm not there for that. I'm there because every single little kid that starts at LA Unified has the right to a good future. So I hope that answered a little bit of your question. What works well at LA Unified? Um, small schools. We have a, a number of small schools, not a lot. In fact, when I became a board member, I think maybe we identified six or seven. And these were schools that were tremendously successful. And so one of the first things I did in my first year as a school board member is to uh, pass a small schools resolution, that we would become a district of small schools. Uh, dual, dual language, language works. works. Explain what dual language Kids is. Kids that are in dual language programs are learning. Um, but do it in Spanish. No, I'm kidding. Lo puedo hacer. Are learning uh, two, at least two languages. And you start with the population of the kids there. And so if you have primarily Spanish speaking kids, you're then bringing in kids who already know um, English and then half of your kids, although it doesn't have to be 50-50, I learned that today, um, that are Spanish speakers. And so you go through your, your daily routine, learning in uh, first in one language, and it's usually the native language of the children of the community. So in my case, I, I grew up speaking Spanish. Um, for the first 
nine, nine months, months, it's, it's all, all everything, everything is all in Spanish. Spanish. So, so the Spanish-speaking Spanish child really is strengthening, strengthening their own language. language. And the, the child, child who speaks only English, English is starting to learn Spanish. Spanish. And, and then, then it, it, it reverses and it changes about nine, nine months later and it goes back and forth. Kids in dual language far exceed all of any other student in LAUSD. And there's something about learning languages that really uh, triggers uh, com complex thinking. Uh, and not only for that, but I keep saying, you know, where, where are the, uh, uh, the schools of the 21st century? We know we now live in a global economy, and yet we insist to be a nation in a particular state that only speaks English. Where in China, 200 million children in China are learning English. So how can we ever prepare our kids to be competitive if a critical skill is language? So we know dual language works. We know, uh, not actually there's not enough evidence yet, but we think pilot schools work. And that's okay, one of what the is a pilot school? Pilot schools are um, essentially um, freed up of many rules and regulations that are imposed by union contracts. And they're also, besides being called pilot schools because they come from model, a model in Boston called the Boston Pilot Schools, um, they're, they're also, also known, known as the thin contract schools. schools. So, so rather than, than a 300 page union contract, you have, I think it's an eight, eight or 10, very, very thin contract. So it frees you up in your school to do things that normally you can't do because the union says you can't. But there's also a lot of state regulations. First of all, every school district is governed by its own school district rules, but the state has tremendous amount of regulations in terms of the size that a school has to be, the fields, you know, in terms of, and then it's got the union uh, contracts, and then it's got fe federal regulation. So it leaves very little uh, for, in terms of movement, if you run a school in a, in a within, within that environment. Um, I would say less so on state and federal. There are some that are a nuisance, um, but by and large, they're uh, significantly freed up from a lot of your traditional rules. You, you can decide uh, a different uh, calendar schedule. You can decide a different hour schedule. Um, teachers can work more as team, as collaboratives. Um, the way in which teachers are hired is very different. You actually get to interview a teacher and decide whether you want that teacher to come and work in the school given this framework that the school is now going to operate under. Something that doesn't happen at most any other school in LAUSD. Talk about the law that you um, proposed and got passed that uh, LA's been, LA Unified's been building all kinds of new schools. As a new school was being built, uh, you proposed that, well, explain to the students what you proposed and what happened. Uh, so Dr. Guerra's talking about uh, the public school choice resolution, I think. Yes. Um, that I introduced last August, and it really grew out of this. This and lots of other uh, moments of frustration where I just saw complacency, where I would see urgency, right? I remember my first year, I wanna just provide this for context, Fernando. Uh, my first year as a school board member, the biggest crisis that hit was our accounting payroll crisis called BTS. Somebody, some of you might have tracked that. That was a crisis, no doubt about it. Teachers weren't getting paid, they were getting underpaid or overpaid, it was a nightmare. Some, some teachers got overpaid as much as a couple hundred thousand dollars. Yes, and we're still trying to get that back. Um, but you know, I saw meetings, daily meetings starting at 5 in the morning, conference calls, afternoon meetings, meetings with the unions, meetings with administrators, meet, board meetings, the superintendent was running around like crazy. Okay, we had fixed it, that, that warranted that. A few months later, we started our budget crisis fiasco. Protests, boycotts, hunger strikes. And that was right? just you. And I kept saying, where is the hunger strike for the dropout rate? 
were the protests for the fact that only 30% of our kids can read at third grade level. I was just dumbfounded that what I saw as a crisis, everybody thought was normal. Normal. So that, these reports, my concern for children, uh, the fact that I knew that unless the rules change, I really appreciate what the mayor is doing with the partnership and I'm fully supportive and I voted to support that. But I worry, Angela, that you will get, that you will not be able to get to the results that you want because a lot of the rules haven't changed. You're still up operating under rules that tie your hands for what you need to do. So, um, so my proposal was um, that, because I believe that I, I needed a lever for change, and I also believe in choice and competition. I believe parents should be able to choose where they want to put their children in school and what kind of school, that we should not be dictating that to you. That just because you live in this neighborhood, and this is your neighborhood school, and by the way, it's a failing school, but sorry, you have to go there. I, I just find that wrong. I also know that we were building beautiful new schools. And by the way, that is one of the things that we do quite well. LA Unified should get total credit for being amazing in building new schools. On time, mostly on budget, a few little scandals, but overall, not bad. And so we were building new schools, and already 50% of those new schools had kids that, were program that became program improvement schools, meaning that you weren't cutting it for the kids. So I also saw that as irresponsible in terms of our duty to the taxpayer, who, who gave us their tax dollars to build schools, and yet the results of what we produce out of these new schools isn't at the level that we should have. So I introduced public school choice resolution, um, and essentially it opened up the process of who would run our schools for any new school that would begin to open up in September of this year now, and uh, schools that were in program improvement three or more. Do you guys know what program improvement means? No. Okay, um, there are very strong benchmarks now from the federal government under a law called No Child Left Behind that schools have to now meet. And we have to now produce data, finally, um, to disclose how are our schools doing. And if um, your schools are not meeting their benchmarks two years in a row, then you become a program improvement school. If that next year, you still didn't meet your benchmarks, now you're a program improvement one. Again, the next year, then you become a program improvement two. We have 260 schools that are program improvement three, which means three plus the first two years, you've been an underperforming school for five years. And we have several way too many program improvement five plus, which means you stop counting after five. And so those have been underperforming schools for years and years and years and years, and no one has done anything about it, no consequences. So in my resolution, if you're a new school starting in September of 2010, or a program improvement three school that has been identified as, we're gonna start with this cluster, and the superintendent picked 12 to start with because can't handle 260 in terms of this process. We were gonna invite then uh, internal and external partners to submit a proposal for how they would run the school. So there would be now a level of competition and it could be a charter, it could be a partnership, like the mayor's partnership, it could be a university, it could be the union, it could be teacher collaboratives, it could be anyone who had a track record and uh, was a nonprofit and had uh, essentially the capacity to run schools and could prove it and had results to show for that. And how many of those were um, bid out for this September? So there were a total of 36. So 36. 12, 12 of the new school, I'm sorry, 12 of the low performing schools, which we called focus schools, 
and then, then the, the rest, rest were new, brand new schools that would begin to open up, and so there were 36 in total. And so the organization that Angela runs and the organization that Steve runs could have applied for this. And they did. So the mayor applied for four schools and three were awarded. Green Dot applied for one and it was not awarded. So out of the 36, Steve, you only applied for one? Out of the 36, there you go back in high school, you're daydreaming again. It's no, no, I'm, no, I'm listening. It's, it's, but I mean, we're, we're talking, again, and, and this, is, this is a bold, phenomenal move here. The way it was set up, and the way the rules were put together was that the parent, people would vote on this. Well, so what happens is the union put people on buses and drove around and voted as many times as they could to each one of them. It's just a total sham. And so then, then it gave cover for the one exception who was doing the right thing for kids was Yoli, and the rest of the school board, who all want to be assembly people and state senators one day and can't piss off the teachers union, all, I don't know, I gotta be nice here, you know, caved in. And, and, and voted, voted. Now, now, now the, the one, one part, part she just said was really important, important. a track a record. United, United Teachers of Los Angeles do not have a track record of running a good public school. school. They've never run, run a good, good public, public school, school right? right? The, the one, one thing that, that they, they do champion are pilot schools, schools which, which sounds really nice, nice. just like small learning communities, it sounds really nice. And no track record of success in those schools. You have in this city some of the best reformers doing the most phenomenal things in the whole country. Not, not just Green, Green Dot, Dot, but KIPP, Kip academies, academies and ISEF schools and the Alliance for Partners schools. School. Charter, Charter school people who, you, you, around, around the country, country people beg you to come build schools for, with them. So, but wait a minute, I don't understand. Well, so, and so, so instead of going with the track record, record what the school board did was, hey, let's, let's give, let's give 40,000 seats. This, this incredible thing that Yoli pulled off, which was getting all the schools open for bid to whoever was the best providers to who was best for kids. What ended up happening, happening is the school board, who nobody knows who they are, is in a, an imperfect system, a failed, a failed system, system, gave all of the school seats to the teachers' teacher union. union. Fantastic. Fantastic. What, what a great, great move. move. That, that just validates everything we're talking about. about. You're talking about, so yes, so you have this amazing light here. This ama my, my school board, board member, the person that, that you know, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I could spend a half hour talking about great Yoli is. The problem is, and there's, and there's other school board members are pretty good people too. In that system though, it's not made to make any big change. And so what you ended up having is, who gives all the seats of the poorest kids in LA to the teachers union to run schools who have never run a school? Fantastic. So two of the highest performing charter schools, Green Dot, the Alliance, clearly above and I mean, they just completely surpassed many of the other proposals. In fact, I, from my vantage point, all of them that came to run the new high school to relieve Garfield, which is called the Esteban Torres High School. Um, and the superintendent had recommended both Green Dot and the Alliance, and then there, it's a campus of five small schools. Green Dot, the Alliance would run two, and then the other three would go to some of these teacher collaboratives, so the UTLA teachers. And, um, and by the way, overall, only seven charters were recommended for the, uh, across the 36. So as it was, there was only seven. Oh, well, now I'm really confused. Okay, so there's 12 schools that exist, but they're so bad, you put them in, you bid them out. And there's um, 24 brand new schools. And your law said it had to go out to bid, right? But out of the 36, only seven were bid? No, only seven were award, uh, recommended by the superintendent. What happened to the What happens to the other twenty nine? They went to teacher groups or to the mayor partnership. Mayor's partnership. Oh, I see. They got three. So there were other configurations, but there were only seven charters that were recommended. Of those seven, um, three got knocked off. The third being ISEP, another very high performing charter. And yes, I believe that a lot of it was about politics. Okay, got so, it. Uh, so let me give me, give me a, a quick look. I mean, I mean cut you up a little bit. Arnie, Arnie Duncan, Duncan, when he, when he was, was the superintendent of, of, of Chicago schools, schools, our secretary of education, education under mayoral control. control. When, we when we took, took over Lock High School, school I, met I met Arnie Duncan, Duncan the next week. Um, and he, he said, said, he brought out a list. Here's 20 failed, failed high schools in Chicago. Chicago. You can have all of them. You can have one of them. You can have 10 of them. 
take as many as you want. Because you guys are doing something that nobody else in the country are doing. You have a union contract. You community organize. And I need you help. What would it take for you to come here? And I got an airplane. I fly back to Los Angeles. Where this, this is with amazing progress that you only put out there. But what pass, there's no leadership. It's just a free-for-all. I mean, who gives 40,000 seats to the teachers union? Only Los Angeles. I mean, it just is the most, and so you have this drift of leadership. And all the adults keep their jobs, which is great, but the kids are getting, and the families are getting screwed. But Angela, in terms of the process, so your group applied for four and got three. We originally got two, and then we submitted to say that the school, they had given one back to the schools, and we felt that we were the better provider, and we submitted a letter to the board, and that went to the board for the final um, decision, and they overturned and gave us the third school. So the, out of the 36, seven will be charters, the others will be run by four charters. Four knocked off three. Right, four, four charters, but then those, those these three as well. Yeah, but they're not Okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, saying, in terms of what, what Steve's talking, talking about, the unions, how, how many, many of the 36 are the unions going to run? 29, right? 30. I think it was 30. 30. Yeah. So, so I, think I think this group, group would get a low score in math, is what I'm talking about. I'm leaving the, I I'm miscounting here. I, I, I want to just make sure that, that I say this, that, um, Steve has demonstrated the capacity and ability to run great schools with a teacher's union. Um, so I don't want this to be about, you know, this, this is all, unions are all bad. I happen to think, and I've said this directly to the union president, A.J. Duffy, so it's not private information, that I just happen to believe that this teacher's union in L.A. is not very progressive and that they have been one of the biggest barriers of reform and change. I've but why? I mean, when people become teachers to do good by children. I don't know. But I'm not talking about the teachers. I'm not talking about the teachers. I'm talking about the teachers' union. But the teachers elect the union leadership. Now, if they would all participate, I think you would have a different leadership. Oh, but that's a different question about mobilization and yes, being active and all yes, that. Well, if we all voted, you would have different leaders. If we all did a lot of things, if we all bought uh, grass-fed beef, we wouldn't have Ralph's. I mean, we would have a lot of things. But, but the point of it is, I missed the link there, but go ahead. Well, I mean, I mean listen, United Teachers of Los Angeles are doing what they're supposed to be doing. I'm a, I was a Teamster. I'm a union guy. We started our own union. I have a partnership with the, with the biggest teachers union in the world in New York. So uh, it's, it's not, not that the, the unions are bad. They're, they're doing, doing their, their job. job. United, United Teachers of Los Angeles is a business, a business based on membership. membership. They get $70, $70 a month, month from, from each one of their members. members. The, majority the majority of the people that participate in the union are older teachers, teachers and for all the right, right reasons, protecting their lifetime benefits and their ability to a tenure to have a job for life. The vast majority of the membership are of a generation or two of, that, that, that weren't around when unions in this city meant something. And so they don't, they don't really, really know, know what the union is. It's automatic. automatic. They, they like it just in case. case. But they, they have, have a hard time. time. Most teachers, teachers, almost every, every teacher, teacher I've met, good teachers hate bad teachers. teachers. They hate they when they're working their butts off and then somebody walks in the hall and there's somebody with their head down on the desk or reading a newspaper. But they don't know an alternative. So when I created an alternative union, it was instead of having a union versus non-union discussion, like, like there's, there's good, good schools, schools and there's bad schools, schools and then the good, good schools, schools should hopefully motivate, motivate people to want more schools like, like those schools, there, there should also be unions to do the same thing. Yeah, yeah but, but see, what, what, what I'm, I'm having, having a difficult time to grasp myself, myself around, it's, it's not, not like voter turnout. turnout. We, we say there are very few people who vote in general elections. When we're talking about teachers, we're talking about highly educated individuals who are talking about their workplace. For me to fathom that they don't participate in their own governance, yeah, that's, that's 10, ten times worse, worse than someone not voting because it's so in, indirect about who's going to be governor, I really don't care, or it's going to have very little impact. Now, I can argue that, that that's not the case. But for teachers, talking about who's going to run their union and impact their everyday workplace, their paycheck, their benefits, and everything, you're, you're talking about, I mean, if you don't go out and vote on, in that situation, you'll never go out and vote. 
but the voting, the voting group is not a large group. There are 43,000 teachers. And I would say when they did the last vote, there were less than 3,000 3, teachers who made a decision for 43,000 teachers. Wow, so that's like a, a under a 10% voter turnout amongst teachers. And there's a house of, of and that teachers. That boggles my mind. Yep. That, that boggles my mind. So. Well, the other uh, upcoming test of this board, and, and you all should watch this, is that, that uh, we have now before us a set of recommendations on teacher effectiveness. And this is another one of my resolutions that I put forward. I felt that, that, that we at least, our kids deserve that we have the conversation around evaluation, seniority, tenure, and um, you could call it merit pay or differentiated pay, there's a bunch of terms. Um, Ted Mitchell, who's the president of the State Board of Education, chaired this group and included all of the bargaining units uh, over six months to come up with we, we hoped, hoped as a board with the most uh, bold and robust recommendations, some of which would have to challenge state policy. Um, and these four, particularly seniority and tenure, are the sacred cows of some of the teachers' unions. I think it's time to change the rules. The rules are not working for kids. That's evident, it's clear. When we couldn't get rid of a teacher that was sexually abusing children, and had, had to, to keep, keep this teacher, teacher for seven years, years and pay him because, because you couldn't get, get rid of him because there's a teacher's panel who oversees our recommendation to let them go and then they can Well, if he's sexually abusing children, why couldn't you just arrest and put him in jail and then that, there he's gone? It's not that process. easy. It's got to they have due process. And it, finally, the, oh, finally, the court forced this panel to change their decision. But it, it took, took a court. court. Oh. In the LA Times. And the LA Times, a series, a Jason Song, phenomenal reporter, a series of exposés that is what has helped us begin to challenge these rules. So that, that's coming up actually in the next couple of months and I'm interested in seeing how, how bold really is this board? So we are here at Loyola Marymount University at the Urban Lecture Series sponsored by the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles, talking about education. Everybody is an education expert. Everybody went to school. Everybody in this room succeeded, so they're all about best practice. Every single student in this room uh, went through a best practice because they are here, and they are going through a best practice right as we speak. So it's, they, they are uh, uh, perfect, perfect examples of, uh, of success. To, to show, show their, their success, success numerous, numerous students are going to stand up and ask questions. <laughs> and so we, we have, have a mic over here for the best and the brightest. We only want the best and the brightest students to stand up, okay? okay? So, so if, if you, you are like Steve Barr and are a C minus student, you can, you can <laughs> keep uh, 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 seated. But if you are a good student, we need you to come up and ask some questions. Uh, one, uh, one of the things, things that, that we always struggled with at, L uh, at uh, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles when we decided to do public policy research is about education. It, it, it is difficult because everybody is an expert. Everybody has these ideas about this is what worked for me, you know, and sometimes what worked for them was 50 years ago or somewhere in, in, in Minnesota or something different. And, and so it's, it's a difficult conversation to have oftentimes uh, with, with individuals. Um, Steve, one reform. If you, if you could, could wave your magic wand, and then we'll ask Angela the same question, and then Yoli, and then we'll turn to the students asking questions. One reform that you could institute, what would that be? So I got asked this in the uh, House, uh, George Miller's Education Committee. There's one thing you could do, and I said, well, I've heard Warren Buffett say this, and Jonathan Kozel both say it, two totally different political parts of the, uh, two, two people with opposing views. If the, the fastest, fastest way to, to fix public, public schools in America is to make private schools school illegal. Now think about that. Think about that. Now that's not going to happen, but it's as hypothetically relevant as discussions about vouchers. But if you made private schools illegal, and again, getting back to, if Arnold Schwarzenegger had to send his kids to Locke High School or Jordan High School or Fairfax or any of those schools, what do you think his year of education is? It's easy. He's the kindergarten cop. He'd be there every day. No. Here's what would happen. Here's what would happen. You'd go, okay. What's, What's working? working? You'd hire McKenzie or Bain or one of these management companies, the Fortune 100 companies hire, and they would ask the first question, what's working? 
scale it fast. What's working in scale fast? Now, in this city, you would not scale the teachers union running a school. Okay, so in this city, you wouldn't, you wouldn't scale a pilot school. You wouldn't scale. So what's the one reform? I'd make private schools illegal, and then you would you'd fix the schools pretty quick. But we don't like that here at Lower Marymount. I know, but this is a but this is an educational environment, and we are trying to broaden the minds. It's not. I'm not a serious. You know, let's. But I'm just saying, think about what political will would happen, and how the sense of urgency, and how we would cut through stuff so fast. If the richest people in this city, and in this country, had to send their kids to public schools, they would get fixed real fast, and a lot of the BS would get pushed aside, and this back and forth tribal warfare would get pushed aside, and the schools would get fixed like that. Okay, but we know that America is elitist, like every single country before, and every current country, and every country in the future, that there's going to be different statuses, and it's going to be uneven. So, in the realm of reality, Steve, <laughs> What, what reform, reform would you <laughs> propose? Well, in this city, I think you need the mayor to take over the schools, not do a partnership, not make sure all the adults are happy with your decisions, but you have to take over the school and put it on the line and say, um, what makes a great city is the public school system, and what stands, and, and Yoli's outrage is absolutely correct, that I, I will do everything I can every minute of every day to fix the public schools. Now, that's not to say, this mayor hasn't taken huge steps, more than any other mayor has, but you have to take control of the schools, you have to change the city charter, and you have to be in charge of the schools, period. Angela? I have to say that that is a beginning, but I think if you do your research and you look at large urbans that have barrel control, there is the movement, but we have yet to educate all children well, even in these urban settings. So we still have more work than to say, if I only had a mayor. And I think we have to put some of the educational um, knowledge, knowledge and research, research to work, and, and I, I think you have, have to have excellent, excellent teachers in all schools. schools. And, and for, for me, me, that means taking um, a real hard look at linking our, our universities with our best practices, with our teachers who are reformed. When I say reform-minded, they close the gap. We don't have that. We have really not, we don't have teachers who are our best teachers in our most challenging schools. And we are playing games we think, we think just, just by, by putting, putting someone there, there you, you still have, have to have a plan, plan that, that really says every child deserves an excellent teacher. teacher. And, what and what does that mean? mean? So, so the, the, the relationship between uh, Loyola Marymount with a school, school that has um, new, new teachers, teachers and, and, and best, best practice, practice mentor teachers, teachers there. there. I, also I also think another reform piece that will really open up the gates of opportunity is redistribution of these dollars. The children in the lowest performing schools are being short-cutted short so, so that, that the, the, the teachers, teachers who are in the higher performing, more seasoned, season, we spend more money, money. I don't know if it's tax, so it might be, I'm not sure, I'm not sure of LA, but more money at schools where more seasoned teachers, because those teachers make between 70, 80, 90,000, and the teachers in my school, they make 40, 38 to 42,000 dollars. They're brand new, they're not getting the resources, we need redistribution, and we need to make sure that we have leadership that is empowered at those sites to make better decisions. I also will say that Yoli and um, Steve are correct. I think this city has tried to bring innovation to um, its school systems, but I think they're afraid to share the ideas. There is no one reform tool that's going to work. And if we're going to do things um, better, is that, that we have, we have to, to be comfortable with portfolio of options. And, and that's, that's a strategy in of itself. There shouldn't be one size fits all of anything. And our teachers are afraid because they're afraid that they're gonna lose their resources, their you know, um, health benefits, you know, someone fighting to get them their raise every two to three years. But we're at a point now is who, do we really value the children? Do we really value the children that live in these schools? And no one is really asking that question, but if we look at the actions We've got 250 schools out of 650 schools that are failing. So a third of the schools in Los Angeles are considered failing schools. There's probably another 200 that are teetering. They're at the border of failing. And what have we done to ensure that the quality of that teacher is in every classroom? Yoli, magic wand? There isn't one. 
Um, and that, that, that's, that's, that's not, not a, a um, with all due respect, respect, that's not a good question for those of us trying to reform education. Is, okay, there is not a magic bullet. It takes great teachers, teachers that aren't working to be able to okay, dismiss do, them. Okay, it see, takes parents being involved. Yeah. So there isn't one. How do, how, do how do we get great teachers? teachers? How do we get parents involved? I mean, in Steve's charter schools, you can't get admitted into the charter school unless the parent comes, right? And at the, be, at the beginning to it. It's part of our culture, it's not required. It's, uh, yeah. you, you, you can't keep a parent or a kid from coming to school because your kid, your parent doesn't come to school. Well, no, I mean, at, there has to be some parent involvement when they do. Yeah, we do, we, uh, we ask for every family to give 30 hours of service. But we don't have a one-size-fits-all. We work with the community, and 90% of our parents do the service because it's a welcoming place to be. I was raised by a waitress, so if in my high school, the only chance my mom could participate was to go to the PTA meeting the third Thursday of every month where people got to yell at each other. So she went to one, and then she goes, I can't get doc pay for this garbage. Now, she would have chaperoned every dance at a Green Dot School, if we went to the Green Dot School, and humiliated me every Friday night there would be a dance, and, but she had done her hours and felt ownership and felt welcome at the school. There's ways of dealing with parents, um, not in a PR way, but in a real way. What can schools of education, Loyola, Marymount, USC, Pepperdine, etc., even the University of San Diego, what can those schools do better, or what, what, are we, what should we do that we're not doing? A lot more. A lot more across, not just across the state, but across the nation, there is a strong sentiment that schools of education are underpreparing teachers and are still using very old models for how to interact with young people. Kids are still bored in school. There's still a whole bunch of Steves <laughs> hanging out there. Um, and there are a significant number of individuals that um, either they come in with or end up with low expectations of kids. If, if I ruled the world of education, I would fire any teacher who told a kid that they would never amount to anything, and, and it happens all the time. All the time. That is, that is just the beginning of hopelessness for a kid who is struggling already for many other reasons. And we just don't put that kind of expectation and accountability on ourselves as administrators and uh, make it very clear what kind of behavior is acceptable and not acceptable. Yeah, because I mean, it's not even the teachers, but it's also the high school counselors. Like they themselves tell you, like they told me, you can't do anything, you know, you don't even, don't think about college, you're not gonna go. Things like that, like so I'm just wondering like how can, so what we're doing, we are, we're revamping our evaluation system and uh, how we will, if the board approves this, how we will be evaluating, and by the way, it's not just teachers, but it will be counselors and social workers and cafeteria workers and janitors, is students will get to weigh in, um, and parents on how, how they think that individual is performing. So we're, uh, it, it's, it's uh, much bigger and bolder than anything that we've ever done. Uh, but this is what I hope will be if, if we have enough courage uh, on the board to pass these recommendations. It will change the way that we not only evaluate but keep teachers who after two years, by the way, in the current system are granted tenure. That means you, you'll be a teacher for life no matter what. Where at a university it takes seven years. Yeah. So there are lots of those kinds of reforms that need to happen. We'll see what happens in the next few months. Angela, quick comment. I would also briefly say that there are a lot of very, very talented teachers who are the outlier teachers who have closed the gap. I think each of you in this room can think of the teachers who got you excited and, and learned. We need to pair those teachers up with those who are in, at universities seeking credentials. We're never, we're, never, we're never putting those people together to match the best practice teachers, the ones who've actually done the work, and put them together so that they can really reinvent and, and, and really have the skills to teach. It is not, teaching is an art as well as a skill, and you've gotta have both of those together. So I think we've gotta be able to bring those pieces together. I think it is a travesty. At Roosevelt High School, I sat with a group of probably 40 parents last year, and they, for the very first time, many of which had seniors, 
did not know that their children did not have, number one, the credit to graduate, and two, those of you that had the credit couldn't even get into a community college because they were taking low-level classes. So we have to restructure and ensure that every child not only has a college-ready curriculum, but they also have to have the supports to get there as well and someone who counsels them in a way that supports them. I never, I had a 3.75 GPA. Not one counselor, not one teacher in my high school experience ever said I was going to college. You know who said it was? My father. All seven of us come from poverty. All seven of us said it. But it was because of my father, not because someone at the school was telling me, you know, you can do it. So we've got to turn that around. Yoli Flores Aguilar, Steve Barhand, Lodas, thank you very much. Thank you.